All right, everybody. Welcome to the non-traumatic musculoskeletal section. Uh, please put your phones on vibrate or silent, if you don't mind, for the presentation. Uh, we are going to start off uh, with Dr. Corey Yablon, clinical professor of radiology at the University of Michigan, and she will be speaking on osteomyelitis, or not, uh, pedial, pedal osteomyelitis versus Charcot. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, Dr. Spence, for inviting me to participate in this section. So I goofed when I filled out my disclosures. I get some book royalties from Elsevier. So we're going to talk about uh, mostly pedal osteomyelitis versus Charcot neuroarthropathy because that's one of the more common um, issues that we have to deal with in the ED. There are plenty of case reports of osteomyelitis uh, masquerading as cancer, but I'm just going to stick to the basics and the most common. So when our ED clinicians uh, see a diabetic patient who presents with a warm, swollen, and painful foot, they want to know, is this infection? Is this merely cellulitis? Is there osteomyelitis in there? Is this a Charcot flare? And then the patient with known Charcot who presents with ulceration and swelling, we need to know is there superimposed infection? Now, 31 million Americans have diabetes, about 9% of the population, and 34% have a lifetime risk to develop a diabetic foot ulcer. And greater than 50% of these ulcers do become infected. And of those that are infected, 20% result in an amputation. Now, Charcot neuroarthropathy is a common complication. The literature will tell you it's rare, but uh, in, in our MSK practice, I see it as common. 70% of non-foot specialists have a very poor or scant knowledge of Charcot. And 95% of these Charcot cases are misdiagnosed, and this leads to unnecessary amputations. And a New England Journal of Medicine article in 2017 noted that 60% of diabetic patients with lower extremity amputations die in five years of that amputation. So the radiologist has an important role to play to be the first to suggest Charcot in patients who are thought to have osteomyelitis but really do not. So some terms we need to familiarize with. The first is myelitis, which is infection of the bone marrow, and osteitis, an infection of the cortex. So risk factors for osteomyelitis include diabetes, trauma, people with immunocompromise who retain foreign bodies. Now, in the diabetic foot, contiguous spread is the most common. Hematogenous is not that common. The infection is usually polymicrobial and will affect pressure points, anything that touches the floor or touches the shoe. So we need to consider the patient as a whole. Do they have chronic illness? Do they have diabetes? Are they immunocompromised? Did they have a laceration or foreign body? Are they systemically ill? Are they septic? Do they have metallic implants or prior hardware? And um, when we look at labs, these tend not to be very helpful because in patients who are chronically ill, CRP and SED rates are elevated, and patients may not even mount a, a really meaningful white count, especially diabetic patients. So we need to look at the clinical picture in addition to all of the other clues that we receive. So this is a case of acute osteomyelitis on radiographs where we see uh, two different patients. The image on the left here, um, we see a markedly, let me see if I can see it, markedly swollen third toe. And the uh, image on the right shows a kind of a permeative pattern of gas throughout the soft tissues and erosion of the bone. When we look at um, bone findings, oh, thank you, it's really hard to careen over here. We, um, we can see that there is effacement of the normal cortex or cortical white line in addition to the soft tissue swelling. So that is one of the first signs of osteomyelitis. 
and then just a magnum version of this toe, we can see rarefaction of the bone marrow and thinning of that normal cortical white line in addition to the soft tissue swelling. Here's another case of acute osteomyelitis where we have an ulcer that clearly is in close contiguity with the overlying bone. The bone also is eroded and the cortex is thinned. And so this is a very good look for acute osteomyelitis. In a different patient on the right, we see a thin gas-filled sinus tract extending to the bone, and we also see erosion of bone at the plantar surface. So both of these images are highly concerning for osteomyelitis. CT can help identify ulcer, cortical involvement, bone erosion, sequestrum and involucrum, abscess if we give contrast, as well as the sinus tract, and intraosseous gas. Uh, we see that better on CT than we do on uh, radiograph. And of course, when we see this in contiguity with a large ulcer crater, uh, that equals osteomyelitis. On MRI, we should remember that normal marrow signal equals no osteomyelitis. If we have normal T1 and normal T2 signal, uh, we don't have to worry about osteomyelitis. Now, intermediate to low T1 marrow signal due to fat metabolism should be suspicious for osteomyelitis. And we also see high T2 and STIR signal. Again, loss of the normal cortex, periostitis, asymptomatic, uh, asymmetric bone marrow edema at the joints, as well as marrow enhancement. So in the image on the bottom, the T1-weighted image, we see effacement of the cortex or thinning of the cortex, and we see confluent intermediate to low T1 signal, as well as high T2 signal. So this is suspicious for osteomyelitis. A similar uh, but different patient here, we have an ulcer crater uh, below the or subjacent to this metatarsal. The metatarsal head and shaft have confluent bone marrow edema. We also see T2 hyperintensity of the cortex. And uh, th these findings together with the subjacent ulcer are highly concerning for osteomyelitis. Now, MRI also can show us sinus tracts, abscesses, septic arthritis, and this is partially imaged on this case here, the toe is a little out of plane, as well as necrotic tissue, where when we add gadolinium, that tissue will not enhance because it's devitalized. Gadolinium also helps outline sinus tracts, which I'll show in a subsequent case, and help us to define soft tissue abscess. So here's a case of osteomyelitis of the hallux sesamoid, where we see a fluid collection subjacent to the sesamoid, which is subjacent to the hallux, the, um, the fir first MTP, or the first metatarsal head, demonstrates abnormal marrow signal. There's fluid at the sesamoid metatarsal articulation that is also contiguous with the abscess. Similarly, on the T1-weighted image, we see intermediate T1 signal within that sesamoid <clears throat> that is confluent with all of the infected soft tissue. The next set of images, same patient, just in the short axis plane, again showing the abnormal signal in the sesamoid in contiguity with the fluid collection that is also uh, draining through an abscess on the plantar side of the foot. And similar findings on T1, we see effacement of that uh, cortex. So one thing that can confuse people is the presence of acute on chronic osteomyelitis. And chronic osteomyelitis tends to occur in patients who are paralyzed or are diabetic or who have had prior um, internal fixation of a fracture or those who are in immunocompromised. In this setting, we see chronic ulceration um, or inadequate treatment of infection. This patient has both uh, chronic and acute osteomyelitis in that the first ray 
is sclerotic and there's bony hypertrophy, but at the central aspect of the first MTP joint, we see erosion of bone. The metatarsal head is gone. The second, third, and fourth MTP joints show acute osteomyelitis in various stages where the second metatarsal head is eroded, as is the base of the second proximal phalanx. The third metatarsal head is eroded. There's relative widening of the joint. And then the fourth metatarsal head also demonstrates erosions. So cortical thickening and thick wavy periosteum uh, is a sign of chronic osteomyelitis. So Charcot neuroarthropathy is a sensory neuropathy first described in conjunction with syphilis. But in the United States, diabetes is the most common association. We also see this with alcoholism, syringomyelia, and peripheral nerve injuries. There is the loss of sympathetic control, uh, causing hypovascularity, and an unrecognized injury leads to ligament damage, leads to osteochondral and capsular injury, which then leads to fracture and what we see as Charcot neuroarthropathy. So Charcot, in the acute phase, presents as local swelling, pain, and redness. The patient is not systemically ill, and that's an important distinction. They also don't have a substantially elevated white count. X-rays can be completely normal. And Charcot will involve the midfoot, as in this case, in about 85% of cases, hindfoot in 10%, and forefoot in 5%. So the five Ds of Charcot neuroarthropathy, which people may have learned in medical school or first year radiology, is uh, deformity. In this case, we have collapse of the hind foot leading to the classic rocker bottom deformity. And this is important to note because once this rocker bottom deformity occurs, then weight bearing is transferred to the cuboid and an ulcer subjacent to the cuboid in the midfoot can be expected. We see destruction of bone, fragmentation or debris, dislocation and subluxation, usually preserved density. And in this case, we also see dorsal subluxation of the metatarsal bases due to disruption of the Lisfranc joint. So the classic findings, again, are sclerosis, osteophytes, subchondral cysts. And uh, those we see very well on MRI. And it's important to note that the subchondral cysts are not very often seen in the setting of osteomyelitis. So we'll see in a few moments a case where a patient has Charcot arthropathy with subchondral cysts, but in the affected side, we don't appreciate that. And we also have subluxation, fragmentation, joint destruction. On MRI, it's common to see diffuse soft tissue edema, but this edema should not enhance after contrast. So it's different from cellulitis, which we expect to enhance. There is diffuse bone marrow edema and enhancement with, of multiple contiguous joints, just as in this image here where we see bone marrow edema in the navicular and in the cuneiform. We see intense edema at sites of subchondral fractures, subchondral cysts, and it's important to note that marrow edema may exceed the soft tissue disease. As again, the same case we see on T2 fat sat axial images, multiple contiguous bones that are associated uh, with the bone marrow edema. We see subchondral cysts. We see osteochondral injury on these T1 weighted images. And then on the T1 fat sat post, we see little uh, or modest enhancement. It's not really flagrant enhancement that we might see with osteomyelitis. Similar findings, again, we see the dorsal aspects of the navicular and the cuneiform affected, uh, and also capsular thickening, which shows marrow edema and enhancement post-contrast. So when we're trying to figure out whether the patient has Charcot or superimposed infection, we need to think about whether the patient has an adjacent ulcer. Do they have soft tissue enhancement suggesting cellulitis? Do they have an abscess, a sinus tract, or fat signal change? So here's the first of five cases I'll show. This case, the patient has diabetes but no ulcer, and, they, and we conclude they have Charcot because 
we see multiple contiguous uh, osseous structures affected with osteophytes, bone fragmentation, subchondral cysts, but marrow signal is relatively preserved. In the T2 fat set, set of images, we see some subchondral cystic change, and one of the subchondral cysts is associated with bone marrow edema, but we don't see edema of the entire bone. And then in this T1 fat set post, we expect to see enhancement of the subchondral cysts, but really not that much enhancement of the bone. In this patient with diabetes who has osteomyelitis and Charcot, we see the classic appearance of the subchondral cysts in multiple adjacent bones. Cortex is preserved. However, in the plantar aspect of the bone that is contiguous with the infected soft tissue, we see effacement of the cortex and we don't appreciate the subchondral cysts. They're sort of buried within the confluent T1 signal abnormality. In the stir image, similarly, we see bone marrow edema. We also see a lot of edema in the soft tissues, and it's difficult to tell if there is an underlying abscess or not. However, once we give contrast, we can see outlining of the sinus tract that also connects to this ulcer crater um, in the midst of enhancing infected tissue. This case involves a diabetic patient who has Charcot neuroarthropathy but no ulcer. And uh, the radiographs appear to be classic with respect to the findings of Charcot. We have collapse of the hind foot with plantigrade rotation of the talus and fragmentation of the navicular. The middle image shows soft tissue edema, modest bone marrow edema with some fragmentation of bone, and the sagittal T1 shows uh, a lot of bone debris that is confluent, uh, multiple adjacent bones that are destroyed. And the uh, STIR images show, again, a lot of bone marrow edema in contiguous bones. And I'll say that the um, the hospitalists were convinced that this patient was infected, despite the fact that the surrounding soft tissues were not that bad. Uh, the patient did have a lot of pain, though, really pain out of proportion to what the foot looked like to them. And even in our reading room, we had a lot of debate. Some people were convinced that this was uh, generalized infection of the hind foot. But when we really applied the principles that we've discussed about um, considering Charcot versus infection, we ultimately agreed that this was Charcot. And when we followed the patient, they did not have infection. We followed um, this patient for quite some time after. But uh, Charcot can look extremely ugly in an acute phase. In this case, we have diabetes with a patient with an open wound. So um, the probe to bone um, test is important. When you see bone uh, communicating with the outside world, you can see it through the um, ulcer. There's probably no reason to image unless you're looking for adjacent disease. So in this case, the bone that is uh, extruded from uh, the navicular cuneiform joint, this is the medial cuneiform, is um, hypo-intense or intermediate in T1 signal and there's a lot of uh, fluid surrounding uh, or adjacent to the abnormal bone that's been extruded with an ulcer crater overlying it. And then in the um, short axis image, we see just this miasma of T1 intermediate to low signal. Uh, so this is a case of a patient who has Charcot but also has infection. And then the last case I'll show is another uh, conundrum um, that uh, occurs pretty often where you see somebody who has treated osteomyelitis. In this case, um, on the left side, we see thinning of that plantar fat pad overlying the posterior calcaneus. And they've had a heel pad resection and probably some bone debridement as well. However, the fat overlying the bone is normal. It's normal fat signal and the calcaneus underlying the fat is faintly T1 hypointense, if at all, but one could think that could be trabecular condensation, just normal for that bone. And then on the SAG uh, stir, we see faint subcortical edema and maybe some thinning of the cortex, but it's really hard to know in this case whether or not this is 
um, new osteomyelitis, chronic osteomyelitis, or reactive osteitis. And I have a reference on the bottom of the slide by Durye et al., um, that's the Penn State group, that wrote an interesting paper looking at what happens to patients in whom they called osteitis or reactive bone versus osteomyelitis. And they found that about 60% of the cases in which they called likely reactive osteitis, those went on to have osteomyelitis. But so it's uh, interesting uh, because they also say in the paper that a lot of the decision making regarding amputation is done on a team basis um, based on the clinical profile of the patient, not just on imaging. So I think in a lot of these cases, especially when uh, there's a conundrum or um, you know, indecision or, or lack of um, hard evidence to show that there's osteomyelitis, it's important to talk to the team to see how they think the patient is doing clinically because you would certainly want to avoid an amputation in someone who doesn't need it. So in summary, we want to look for an ulcer or a sinus tract in infected patients. We should know that Charcot affects multiple contiguous joints. Marrow changes centered around both joints are seen in Charcot, whereas in osteomyelitis, we tend to see marrow changes greater at one side of the joint than another. And subchondral cysts are uh, one of the key diagnostic criteria seen in Charcot. We tend to see that much less in osteomyelitis. And remember that osteomyelitis affects pressure points, so toes, metatarsal heads, calcaneus, and the cuboid if there is hind foot collapse. Charcot tends to affect the midfoot most often in 85% of cases. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yablon. That was absolutely awesome. Obviously, it's something that comes up fairly commonly in the ER, trying to work out the difference between Charcot and osteo and who has both. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit right now, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, arthroplasty complications. You are in the emergency radiology track, so this is going to be arthroplasty complications presenting to the ER. And so hopefully I can show you a couple of fun things that you haven't seen before. So I'm Susanna Spence, and I'm coming from UT Houston. I have nothing to disclose. So here are today's objectives. Um, one question would be, you know, why is the ER having so much trouble reducing this particular knee dislocation? What is the difference between these two arthroplasties at the bottom, and why do you care? Um, we see so many of these patients coming in with uh, peri-hardware fractures at the moment. What does the surgeon want you to tell them about them? And, uh, you know, I've left this one up for a little bit on that right-hand side. There's some kind of anatomic variant on there that may be worth knowing about. So if you're talking about arthroplastic complications, there's a whole bunch of ways I could have gone with this, right? I mean, uh, you know, we could talk about peri-hardware lucency, so-called particle disease, right? Um, down here, these are all just patellar findings, right? A fractured patella, a dislocated patella, a dislocated patellar spacer, you know, a completely dislocated uh, TKA spacer, and we're not even out of the knee yet, right? Um, this is all fascinating stuff as well. I did include these pictures in here in case you want to look them over, but um, when they show up, they tend to be a little bit self-evident, you kind of know what's going on. Um, so since we only have a few minutes here today, and we're gonna focus on a couple of things that may be less evident to you. Now, of course, we can't talk about arthroplastic complications without briefly throwing this out there. You know, do watch out for the usual suspects. You, you have the same risks of dislocating an arthroplasty as someone who's dislocating a native knee, right? So uh, do watch out for things like popliteal artery injury. Obviously, this patient has ligamentous injury as well in those medial and lateral collaterals. But all that's too easy. All right, so there is one subgroup of total knee arthroplasties that create a trauma problem that is actually unique. And if you don't recognize it, and the ER doesn't recognize it, you have put that patient in for a very long day. So here is a patient. The ER has been trying to reduce this knee for hours. This is how he came in. And this was attempted reduction number one. And there is attempted reduction number two. I know these look very similar. We can do the spot the difference, right? There's a clip in a different place. Uh, th these are actually different ones. After the third attempted reduction, um, they decided that they had actually reduced him. So they sent him home and he came back two days later and he looked like this. So what is it about this particular replacement that is causing them so much trouble? 
Well, so to know what the answer to this is, you do need to know a little bit about the basic design of total knee arthroplasties. There's a whole bunch of them out there, and this is not a lecture on the types of arthroplasties, um, and we don't have time, and quite honestly, you don't even need to know for most patients, uh, but I do want you to be able to tell the difference between these two. So this is the most basic type of knee replacement. This is called PCL retaining or cruciate retaining and is a, just basically a resurfacing of the knee. You can see on the uh, tibial plate here, they left a space behind for where the PCL is gonna come out. And on that radiograph, basically what you see is everything that was a cartilage surface on the femur and the tibia is now very thin, smooth metal, right? We just put metal where the cartilage used to be and we put a spacer in between. This is the other very common one. It's called PCL substituting or posterior stabilizing. This one sacrifices the PCL. And uh, the femoral component contains this square thing uh, right here, which is conveniently called a box. Um, and it has something called a cam bar that engages a polyethylene post during flexion. This is gonna be much more clear in just a second. So why does a radiologist care one way or the other? Well, it has to do with the mechanics of this particular type of arthroplasty. So when you flex your knee in order to prevent posterior dislocation, the function of the PCL, there is this little red bar that I kind of colored in red that is back here in red that as you flex runs into this big plastic post, the polyethylene post, right? So as you flex, you can't posteriorly dislocate because this cam bar is not going to let you. Well. I'm guessing, you know, since that's the way it's supposed to work, you might have already predicted how this might go wrong. Um, so what happens if you take that post and uh, you take that cam bar and you actually jump it over the post? Well, you know, since you're jumping over the post, you'll have no idea what this is called, right? This is called cam jump. Um, so PCL substituting, posterior stabilizing arthroplasty, it's got that extra box on it. Here's that patient that we just saw. What happens if I zoom this up? You can actually see, because he dislocated so brilliantly, poor guy, uh, that that is that post. So I kind of colored it in green, and I'll take it back off again, right? So there is this big post, and we know, based on the design of this arthroplasty, that there's a bar going across here, and now we're on the wrong side of the post. And so what happens when you try to just push this knee back again, right? I mean, it looks like it's going the right way, right? Um, looks like it's going the right way, you know, we keep trying to reduce it, it's not ending up where it's supposed to be. It's still sitting posterior, right, because that bar is in front of the post. And so obviously he came back like this again. So this is cam jump. You can't reduce the knee just by pulling it back into alignment like you could with just that regular, um, regular resurfacing knee arthroplasty. You have to get the cam bar back over the post, so save your patient a very long day. You can, some of the, for some of these, actually reduce them in the ER, but it takes hyperflexion and some real pull on that tibia to get it back under the post. This particular patient, in order to get him reduced in the end, had to go to the OR to do it. So, so this is how you tell the difference again. There's that basic resurfacing, very thin line of um, uh, metal around the side with a little peg to stop it from sliding around. And then this is that posterior stabilizing. The PCL is gone, so look for that thing called the box to tell you that you're dealing with a posterior stabilizing. Now, a few years back, um, the ortho residents, they started complaining, they were grumbling, that there was a new kind of posterior stabilizing and they couldn't tell the difference between the posterior stabilizing and the cruciate retaining. Um, but you know, this is it. I still think you can tell the difference, right? I mean, you know, it's got a thinner box on it, but it still has a box compared to that just thin peripheral cruciate retaining. So again, if you see a box on it and it's sitting too far forward, you're starting to worry about cam jump, do let the ER know that because they may need to uh, change their approach to get that uh, knee reduced. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about peri-hardware fractures. Um, as our population ages and more and more arthroplasties are going in, we are seeing this more and more often. Um, and so, you know, by the way, don't try and work out what kind of arthroplasty this is after you've just learned to try and tell the difference because this one is oblique, right? But setting that aside, what does a surgeon actually want to know about this particular, arth um, this particular fracture? This is the most commonly used classification system, um, but I actually don't have it on here so you can memorize it. This is really basic stuff. So all it tells them is uh, whether the fracture is displaced or non-displaced. Nobody needs to tell a radiologist that we need to describe in our report whether a fracture is displaced or not displaced, right? The only other component on this is whether the uh, implant is stable or unstable. So basically what they want you to tell them is, is that 
bone up against the arthroplasty crumbled, or is it pretty, it, does it look pretty much intact? And of course, you can also have an unstable arthroplasty because of something pre-existing, right, if you had a bunch of lucency around it. Okay, so this, for this patient, they came to the ER, you've got this you know, sort of spiral fracture, you don't have to actually tell them stable or unstable, but describe what is involved, right? Fracture is extending down to the anterior flange of the arthroplasty. They often do, actually. This is a bit of a stress riser here. It's displaced over the front. But, you know, we've got all this lovely bone down here that looks pretty much intact, right? Lots of nice intact bone down here around the arthroplasty itself. So this looks pretty good. Looks like we can fix it, right? So we just put a retrograde nail across it. Looks great. Okay. Well, how about this one? Highly comminuted, right? Really don't like how far distal this one's going, particularly on that lateral radiograph line. We've got a lot of comminution down in here. Uh, here it is on CT. This is the one with the IMR on it. This is the one without, right? So you can see, again, lots of involvement way down here in the box. So this is a patient that they couldn't save. They went on to a distal femoral replacement arthroplasty. There just wasn't enough good bone left to hold on to that arthroplasty. Okay, so this is really what you're telling them, right? Displaced and comminuted or not, and how much of it is involving this part of the arthroplasty around the arthroplasty itself. So we're gonna practice this real quick. Um, I do apologize for these very ugly 3Ds, but this is what you get when they come right off the scanner, right? This is just what you get in real life, so it's a, it's a good representation. So we've got a very comminuted fracture here, coming down pretty low, um, but you know, maybe this is okay. Turns out, as I said, if we go down the axial CT images, we got a lot of comminution up top, but it starts getting a little simpler as things go down. We've got a couple of fragments that have been displaced into the medullary canal here, maybe a tiny little fracture there. But by the time we get down to the arthroplasty itself, it's actually looking pretty good. And so even though it was highly comminuted above the arthroplasty, once we got down into the bone around the arthroplasty itself, there wasn't a lot of bony involvement. So yes, they did need to put quite a bit of hardware to uh, secure this arthroplasty again, but because that comminution didn't get down there into the box, they were able to keep this arthroplasty in place. So in terms of what, which arthroplasties can be saved, question is, does it extend down into the level of the hardware? Basically, is there enough intact bone to get these screws in or to get a nail in in order to save that replacement? Okay, so in terms of hips, Vancouver is the most common classification system. Again, you do not need to memorize this. This kind of makes sense, right? Is it just one of those sort of appendage? Is it just a lesser troke or a greater troke? Um, does it involve the implant itself? That would be a B. And then C is, yeah, there happens to be an implant in this bone, but this fracture has nothing to do with the implant itself. Um, there are several subtypes of B to decide whether it's stable or unstable, and I actually haven't listed it because, quite honestly, the surgeons themselves find it very difficult to predict which of these fractures are actually stable versus unstable, and go into the OR prepared for both. So obviously, if it's crushed, then we know it's unstable, but a lot of times, even if it looks stable or there's just a little fracture through the, the base of the stem here, they get in there and find out that it's unstable after all. So here's a patient that uh, has what looks like a, a greater troke fracture in addition to another fracture. When we get to the CT, we can see that greater troke is actually well corticated. This was an old avulsion of the greater troke. Here's the more recent fracture going right through the implant and through the cement here. You can imagine if she starts walking on this again, that this is not going to stay stable. So this one had to be revised. Okay, so anything on these knee images that you would like to warn a surgeon about in this particular preoperative knee patient? And um, I'll, I'll give you a hint. You have already finished all that part of your MR report where you described everything in the knee joint. That, that part's totally done. Forget the knee joint. You're now on everything around the outside of the knee joint. So anything you'd like to talk about. All right, so um, do you um, ever sit around thinking about popliteal artery variants? Do you not? No. Um, so what if they were risky popliteal artery variants? So here is a normal popliteal artery, right, in the green there, behaving nicely, going down the back of the knee joint. There it goes. And, uh, you know, sits on top of the uh, popliteus muscle here, and then off comes the anterior tibial and takes off down the calf. Okay, we're going to compare it to the patient we saw a second ago. This patient has a, what we call a high or aberrant origin of the anterior tibial artery. It comes off really high and sits in front of the popliteus and runs down underneath the popliteus um, all the way down into the calf. Now again, why do we care? We've got this very different appearance. This one is the popliteal artery with the uh, anterior tibial hasn't come off yet. Lots of nice space between that artery and the back of the bone. And then here is that anterior tibial artery. And again, you can see how far this thing really just hugs the posterior cortex of the tibia. 
Now, in terms of why we care, how do you think they got that tibial plate in? I mean, it's not a very nice flat surface they got it in there, right? So here's, uh, you know, they're in the cadaver lab. Uh, there's the femoral condyles, right, that they've just uh, sliced, and there's this tibial plate that they're putting in. Um, but before they put that tibial plate in, this is what it looked like. Beautiful, flat surface, right? How do you think they got that? Well, they took a big saw to it, right? Um, you know, then we, getting the angle right, so they sawed across the, front, the top of that proximal tibia. So how do you feel about this particular variant now? So this is a patient, so there's the PCL just as well. So if you think about things that can go wrong with this particular variant, if you're having a PCL reconstruction, there may be a little bit of a problem. Um, if you're trying to suture the lateral meniscus back to the capsule, and you want to get a really good bite on that capsule. You don't want that lateral meniscus coming loose, right? Get a good bite on that capsule with your suture uh, and sew that clean closed. So um, this particular one has some particular complications. Total knee replacement, as you can imagine, uh, fracture surgeries, high tibial osteotomies, lateral meniscus repair, PCL reconstruction, all of those if you happen to have this particular variant. And it's in 1% of the population. It's not actually all that uncommon. And of course, you actually don't have to see this on MRI, right? You can get it on your CTA that's for another purpose. You can do it with contrast CT where you're looking for abscess and the like or for tumor. So if you see this one, though, let them know. So in summary, why is the ER having so much trouble reducing that knee? Because this is cam jump, right? So you let them know that it's going to be a more difficult reduction than most. And look for that box so you can show which patient is going to have that cam jump as opposed to the one that cannot. In terms of the uh, fractures, we want to know, can I save the arthroplasty or can I not? Is it comminuted up to, against it or is it not? Does the fracture go through the arthroplasty or is it incidental? And watch out for that high origin of the anterior tibial artery. Even if this patient isn't up for surgery yet, put it in the impression because they may need surgery in the future and it's good for them to know about it. So a couple of references for you there. All right. <laughs> Well, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Berang Amini from MD Anderson Cancer Center. He's an associate professor of radiology, and he is going to be talking about pathologic fractures, present, absent, or impending. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation and for that introduction. All right. I do not have any disclosures. All right, so the um, objectives are to review pathological fractures, understand pathological fracture risk, ratification, and um, once we get over that, just see a lot of cases. And, you know, pathological fractures are technically, there's some minimal trauma, but not, you know, the trauma we're used to. So when you come across a, a fracture, the, um, uh, the questions you want to ask is, um, what is a pathological fracture first? When should you worry? How do you avoid mistakes? And then um, finally, we're just going to see a lot of cases. So let's talk about the what first. So. Um, Fractures can be divided into uh, traumatic or atraumatic, or let me get the mouse there, minimally traumatic in, in a lot of cases. The minimally traumatic, atraumatic ones can either be stress fractures, and under that we get fatigue fractures, insufficiency fractures, and the definitions are below, you can see those. Um, the atypical femoral fractures, or just atypical fractures, we see in bisphosphonate and denosumab use, and uh, very rarely in other medications. Uh, these used to be called um, medication-associated fracture or medis medication related fractures. And then finally, pathological, and that's the one we're going to be talking about today. Fractures through a focal lesion, and these can be benign or malignant, although we usually think of these as being uh, malignant. So let's just see a few cases. This is a 70-year-old man with RCC. You can see the uh, lesion in the femoral head extending to the neck and intertrochanteric region, and then this comminuted fracture. This is a patient with multiple myeloma. You can see this permeative lesion with a fracture. This is a benign lesion in an chondroma with a pathological fracture through it. And then this is a, an 85-year-old man, woman with rectal carcinoma, and you can see this pathological fracture of the, um, of the acetabula. A 70-year-old uh, man with lung cancer, you can see this subtle lytic lesion in the glenoid with intraarticular extension. There's the CT nicely showing you the destructive lesion. And then 80-year-old man with colon cancer, you can appreciate this fracture over here. Maybe there's some lucency, but remember the CT is going to be really helpful. You can see the actual pathological fracture and a second fracture at L5. You know, um, the one view, no view can be extended to one CT is better than 100 x-rays. So that's the, the what. Let's go to when. So when do you want to worry about um, fracture, pathological fractures impending 
um, or otherwise. So first you need to look at where you are in the body, in the long bones, in the spine, or basically everywhere else. In the long bones, we have morels. We have sins in the spine, and then basically we are kind of on your own everywhere else. So just describe the fractures and hope, um, hope you're okay. So the morels classification um, and sins classification, let's uh, st start with morels. Uh, it's commonly used by ortho. It's reproducible, so um, you can teach this to your fellows. Um, based on three x-rays and one clinical feature, the uh, features are location in long bones, degree of cortical destruction, uh, lesion matrix, and presence of pain. And then um, don't tell Morels, but we also use it on other um, uh, modalities. Uh, this is basically the uh, classification scheme. There's a, a three points given for location of the lesion, radiographic appearance, size, and pain. And pain, obviously, we don't usually have that much information about. And then you add all those up, this is, um, and then if it's greater than nine, you um, say prophylactic fixation is rec uh, recommended. Um, like every other thing in the medical literature, the first time someone publishes something, it's great, and then it uh, starts declining in, um, in reliability after. And this was initially very great. It's not so great now, but it's kind of the best system we have, and it kind of puts things in a, gives you a framework for thinking about fractures. So let's look at this one. This is the patient who came in, uh, came in for an indication of pain. You can see a lytic lesion in the um, uh, distal to mid diaphysis. So let's just count lower extremity, you get two points. It's a lytic lesion, so you get three. The size, you look at the, how much of the cortex is thinned, you get another three. And then you have pain in the indication. Usually this is correct, but sometimes not. And then, so we'll just give him one plus for mild pain. And then this ends up being a nine plus, and then you end up with a nine score. So this is an impending pathological fracture. Um, this is what we tell our uh, overnight trainees. Discuss with the primary team. Um, after hours, you want to make a phone call. Um, and then you just put this verbiage that ortho approved. They don't want to get overcalled. They don't want to get undercalled. So we kind of came up with this for our institution. And um, no one cares about the actual score, so don't put it in our report, at least in our institution. So this is the um, initial Im image, and this is the post-op. FU, and there you can see the uh, intermedullary nailing for um, prophylaxis of that fracture. All right, let's move on to the SINs. Um, let me just open a uh, nitpick uh, about the SINs. A lot of people call this the SIN score. That's like saying pin number, MRN number, MRI image, or PIC line, so just, um, just be aware of that. And this is a little bit more complicated. So this we go by location, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, the more mobile parts of the spine are more, get the higher score. So junctional occiput to C2, C2, C7 to T2, thoracolumbar and lumbosacral junction gets a higher score. Similar to Morel's, um, you get lytic mixed and blastic. Spinal alignment is in there. Um, the, the scheme isn't um, always one, two, three. This is zero, two, four. And then you look for collapse at a 50% um, um, cut point. You look at posterior lateral involvement, basically the pedicles um, and um, posterior elements, and then pain. This is something uh, we can't really do much about. Uh, so, but it's a little bit more simple, uh, simpler than the morels, yes, or occasional, but no, um, not mechanical. So this is all great. You know, you hear about sins at the RSNA, and then you actually try to put it in your report, and it's a little bit confusing, right? Um, luckily, we have um, this wonderful um, dictation system. Um, you may not have the same one as us, but this is um, this is ours. Um, and you can basically put this in and just um, get the numbers going. And um, you can do simple math and get the um, um, get the classification going. So zero to six is um, basically stable. Seven to twelve is potentially unstable. Greater than twelve is unstable. And just for completeness on our MR reports, I also put in the Bilski score and the uh, intradural disease. Um, just to get everything ready for RADOC. All right, so we talked about that. How do you avoid mistakes? So look for subtle lesions. A lot of times you'll see a fracture and you're not sure if it's a pathological fracture, and then they go in and um, stabilize it, and then you're like, oh crap, this patient has widely metastatic disease. Now you've um, spread that uh, tumor down the leg with the intermedullary nail. Um, no uncommon manifestation of the different fractures. And then just stop when you see an unusual fracture and um, recommend, um, uh, recommend additional imaging. And then let's um, look at some cases to give you some experience. All right, uh, let's see case one. 
So this is a multi-cancer patient, um, 60 years old, Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, let's see, Hodgkin lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, gastric cancer, breast cancer. This is our typical MD Anderson patient, unfortunately. And then now is having two months of right lower leg pain. And you can see a uh, fracture over here, but maybe not a lot of destruction over here. Uh, maybe some sclerosis around it. Um, let's look at some CTs and, and bone scans. Let's start with the bone scan. You can see the um, increased uptake here, some photopenia, and then just regional uh, increased uptake about the knee. Let's just scroll through these images and then just start making a decision in your head if you think this is what kind of fracture this is. All right, and then we'll do the orthogonal plane. All right, so what kind of fracture is this? Just um, on our system. A typical fracture, insufficiency fracture, pathological fracture, traumatic, or none of the above. All right, this ended up being a breast cancer met. You can see this kind of um, subtle area on the, on the x-ray, maybe, in retrospect. Um, on the CT, you can see the trabeculae are kind of destroyed right here. So that was your, your clue that this was um, a pathological fracture. This is just gas, uh, kind of a red herring. Case two. This is a 17-year-old girl with pain after fall six months ago. Um, just two images here for you. Uh, you can see this transverse fracture, lots of dense stuff. So what kind of fracture is this? Atypical, insufficiency, pathological, traumatic. So this is um, the osteosarcoma at presentation. And this thing that maybe to the um, init initiated may have looked like exuberant callus was just the um, osteosarcoma with the osteoid matrix after chemo. A 55-year-old uh, with, woman with lung cancer and brain mets. Chemo was completed six months ago. Now his uh, patient is presenting with lower extremity swelling. And these are the two images we're going to get. You see this transverse fracture in the anterior, anterior tibial cortex. And then I'm not really sure if I can appreciate it on the AP. All right, so what kind is this one? Yeah, this ended up being a pathological fracture through a very subtle lesion on x-ray, but a uh, very much more obvious lesion on the MR. 65-year-old woman with lung cancer treated with XRT one year ago, presentation to the ER with back pain. And then you can see the T1, T2, and the um, post-contrast image. You can see maybe some areas of preserved fat within the marrow, this line right here, and then diffuse enhancement. And then um, I guess I'll give it away. There's this um, increased medullary fat content um, up here for the, uh, from the lung cancer XRT. This ended up being an insufficiency fracture for, uh, for the bone weakened from radiation. Case five, I know these are easy, but hopefully this one will be a little bit more challenging. 80, 80 year old woman with multiple myeloma, post stem cell transplantation, now is coming in with elbow pain. And uh, this is the, uh, the little fracture right here. So what type is this one? Um, so this was a multiple myeloma patient who'd gotten um, high-dose bisphosphonates. And this is um, the one and only atypical fracture that I've seen outside the femur. But that's, uh, you have the cortical bump, you have this um, lucent line over here. So just a weird case. Let's see how much time, three minutes. Let me go jump to case seven. You got time? Okay, fine. Thank you. Good All right. So this is a 65-year-old man with melanoma of the face, not metastatic. Oh, thank you. Um, these are a series of images of the, um, of the sacrum um, and then the MRI of the sacrum down here. I'll scroll through all of them simultaneously so you can see. Um, look at the areas of fat in the sacrum. We see this commonly in older patients. And then here's the fracture, right? So you see these fracture lines going through the um, sacral ala. There's the T1 image at the same time as this CT up here. So hopefully a little bit straightforward until the follow-up. And then just one month later, the patient came in for a follow-up and then this one on the bottom is a follow-up follow three months later, three months after this one. So let's just scroll through. So you can see the nice fracture planes. And then now you have these rounded areas of T2 hyperintensity 
and T1 intermediate to low, and then peripheral enhancement. And then on follow-up, these things get smaller. On the T1, on T2, they're still there, but maybe a little bit smaller. There's this, also this thing in the posterior ilium. And then just for completeness sake, these are the um, B50, B800, and ADC. And the ADC values range between 1.9 and 2.1 inside these uh, little areas right here. All right, so what kind of fracture was this one? Uh, so this was, uh, these were insufficiency fractures, pretty straightforward on the initial. The follow-up was the one that confused people with the um, developing quote-unquote lesions, uh, which were just areas of fat necrosis. So just be aware of this so you don't get fooled. And we think the same thing was happening in the posterior ileum as well. And then the final case, this is an 80-year-old man with balance issues and multiple falls, and these were the images that he presented to our institution with. Let me just zoom in. And you can see this, uh, this very nice clean cut through the femoral neck. This, there's no surgery in this patient. Um, no dislocation, just this area of destruction through the, um, through the femoral neck. And let me show you the image four months ago from the outside. There was this, maybe you can appreciate a little fracture right here at the time. This was um, not diagnosed at the time. Nothing was done and the patient came back looking like this. So what kind of fracture is this? So this was just a traumatic fracture, a post-traumatic osteolysis of the femoral neck. Uh, calling back to the first talk, um, we think it's um, some kind of um, neuropathic process where the, the patient just walks on this fracture without feeling pain and results in this osteolysis over time. But um, a little bit of a weird case for us. All right, that's uh, everything. We've talked about all these items. If you have any questions, that's my email. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Amini. That was fabulous, as always. Um, we do have a couple of minutes here for questions. For anybody who's online, I, I do understand that you can post questions online as well. Um, while people are coming up with qu these questions, I do have a question for Dr. Yablon because this comes up in our practice a fair amount. What do you do with that patient that comes in with a toe ulcer that has edema in the toe but not the confluent decreased T1 for clear osteo? They've got just a little bit of edema, maybe a little bit of reticular T1. How do you manage those cases with those sort of borderline findings in your practice? Uh, thanks for that question. So it depends. Uh, the proximity of the ulcer, if there is an ulcer. And uh, if an ulcer uh, probes to bone and we see T2 hyperintensity but no T1 hypointensity, uh, we just wait a minute until that shows up. But if we uh, do not have an ulcer probing to bone and we do see only T2 hyperintensity, we do couch our uh, description with reactive osteitis versus early osteomyelitis, just uh, like the Penn State uh, people did in their paper. And we have a conversation with the surgeons and the um, medical team to decide how to uh, manage this patient, because not all cases are obvious by any means. Thank you. We do have one more question actually for you from online. Oh. Uh, do you routinely use post-contrast sequences in the assessment of suspected diabetic foot osteomyelitis? Yes, we do. And the reason uh, we do it is to help us outline the soft tissue findings. To call osteomyelitis, you certainly don't need contrast, but it does help when we're looking at the adjacent findings. Thank you very much for that. Any other questions from the floor? Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll be hanging out a little bit if anyone wants to chat. <laughs>